My name is Era, and I'm the host of the Tamil Creator Podcast. I chat with creators from all over the world to share their stories and discuss hot topics in a way that I hope inspires, educates, and entertains you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Tamil Creator. I'm your host, Era, and today I have a very uh, exciting guest. He is joining me all the way from Silicon Valley. Uh, he's been there for quite a while and quite successful. His name is Ruben Kanapati Pille, and he's a serial entrepreneur. He's a founder of multiple successful startups, was exits in quite the high range, and I'll let him kind of talk about that. He's an angel investor, and now he's kind of in that phase of life where he's taking all the success and knowledge that he's kind of built up over these last few years. And he's giving back by doing mentoring. And he's also um, doing an ongoing series, which I follow on LinkedIn called The Accidental Entrepreneur. Um, for quite a you know very successful guy, very low key and unassuming if you didn't know his story. Uh, so I'm excited to kind of share his story. So uh, Ruben, why don't you, you know, introduce yourself for the people in your own words and tell us about you know, your family, your upbringing, and you know, maybe even how you got to the Bay Area and kind of go from there. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ara. Thanks for this opportunity. And I want to come, everybody uh, who is going to be listening to this series. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I, I like this opportunity to talk to many of you and, you know, tell my story because I think, as uh, Ara told, uh, said earlier, it is not, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm a you know, flashy guy, I'm trying to be, uh, you know, uh, know all. But I was able to, you know, get to this level of success by doing something, you know, some simple things, some basic things, and some of the upbringings uh, from Sri Lanka. So to go back, um, you know, I am from a small town in Jaffna called Pololi, uh, and uh, you know, I was born in 1970s, and uh, you know, um, I am. Uh, you know, seventh child of, you know, seven uh, kids family, you know, my, you know, I'm the last one uh, in the, in that family. And uh, so we lived in Plowley for a long time. And when people ask me about Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan ethnic war, I tell people I am an embodiment of that Sri Lankan war, because if you look at it, I was born in 1970 and 1972 to 75. Uh, the, the, you know, the trouble started coming. I remember going to some of the political, uh, you know, tra- uh, you know and the rallies when I was seven, eight years old. That was, you know, before the arm um, insurrection. Uh, and then, you know, we went through 1983 and after that. Uh, so we'll talk about some of the hardships I went through. So I was there from, you know, 1970 to 1989. So I went through that life where, uh, you know, as a family, uh, you know, we were we were a business people, but you know, in during that time when I was twelve, I lost my father to heart attack. Is you know a medical issue, and uh, you know we lost. And because of my family, my brothers, my sisters, I was able to continue my studies while still working in my, uh, in my father's shop, which was to, taken over by my brother afterwards. So that is some of the entrepreneurship uh, stories, you know, will start early in that life. So I will talk about that later. And so that is my family background. The, during that time, I met my wife, actually. The family means, the, you know, the two components. So one of them is where I came from at the originally. Then my wife, I met her very early in my stage. She's my classmate uh, from my ele- elementary school. And so I know her for quite a long time now. And uh, then we went to high school together. That is where we, you know, I asked her and we, you know, agreed to, uh, you know, uh, be each other's soulmate. And that's one of the writing I, I did about that. And then she went to medical school and I came to US and, uh, and then we, you know, she came here after graduation. So all of, you know, my family, my, me and my wife, and uh, so th- then the last part of it is, so I am, you know, three kids, uh, two daughters and one son. My older one is uh, at a un- in the uni- University of California, Berkeley. She's doing computer science. Interesting thing, which I'm proud of her is she's doing a double major or triple major in linguistic and Tamil. Uh, that is one of the areas she's in- interested in doing with computer science 
where she is looking at this natural language processing, how that is, uh, you know, this is, you know, the language like our classic, uh, classical language Tamil, how that can be uh, brought into, uh, you know, computer world with all these new language learning processing and all that. So that is what she's studying. So, so that is my whole family story. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, no, I, I love talking to people like yourself that have kind of, you know, you have a lot of life experience, not just business wise, but otherwise, which you kind of obviously can kind of share with the audience. So you mentioned that your wife uh, ended up moving to the US, I think you said for medical, uh, like, uh, I think she was pursuing to be a doctor. No, she completed her medical degree in Jaffna. That's in Jaffna. another interesting part of our journey. Okay. So between 1990, I left, and 1999, she was in Jaffna in the war zone, okay. and she was going to the medical school there. I and see. even though we got married in 96, uh, she w wanted to go back and complete her medical school. So she went to Jaffna during the war time. She spent, and you know, her, she had enough experience of working in the field helping, you know, refugees and, and uh, refugee camps and the schools and all that. So, yeah, but she moved here after completing her degree there. Got it. And I know, and I, I know you originally, when you settled in the U.S., you didn't start off in, you know, the Bay Area. So what made you, because obviously the, the Bay Area now is like, you know, everyone kind of knows the secret is out, you know, when, you know, all these entrepreneurs like yourself, you know, Steve Jobs, everyone started like kind of doing their thing in the Bay Area is very different than, you know, when you went there, when it now, you know, where everyone, it's a kind of a very hot area. So what prompt, number one, what prompted you to move to that area? And then number two, can you describe how it's changed in the time from when you first moved there to now? <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting. So it is, you know, I, I came to Bay Area after my undergrad to go to grad, grad school at Stanford University. So I came here in 93, I think 93, 94. Uh, I completed my degree there. Right after my degree, actually I chose to leave Silicon Valley uh, and go to Southern California to work in uh, a, a different company. The one of the reason was even then it was very, very fast paced and very aggressive very cutthroat uh, industry in Silicon Valley. So to me, that was, you know, I wanted to contribute, but I didn't want to feel like so much, you know, in the rat race or some of these part of it. Uh, so I left uh, for five years, I went to Southern California uh, where I worked at my first job at Rockwell Semiconductor, uh, where I worked with a lot of these aerospace and, you know, aeronautical engineers who were working on electronics part of it and there and during that period we'll talk about how i started this company but we got funding for our idea for the first startup vxtel we will talk about later also and that you know at that point the vcs were from silicon valley and their only condition was all of us or the, there were five founders all of us agreed to move back to bay area uh, being close to them the reason for that was uh, I we were I was in twenties and most of us were you know young in you know late twenties or early thirties so they needed somebody they wanted to be close by to babysitters you know? <laughs> uh, and they, they didn't want to you know leave us in uh, in far away where they had to take a flight so they forced kind of forced us to move back to this one wow. uh, so it's been now about twenty some years uh, the the once I came back. And then only I realized, because I, even though when I was at Stanford, I didn't realize about all these startups and all that I heard about it, uh, you know, Sun, Silicon Graphics, Intel, and all of them. But when I came back, when I get into this ecosystem of venture capitalists, angel investors, uh, advisors, and all that, that's the only thing I realized. It is, it is nothing comparison to anywhere else. You know, you have everything in one place. Uh, interesting. So... You were saying even back then when you first moved there 20 plus years ago, it was still fast paced, uh, but you haven't seen it get like even more fast paced or like, you know, after all the IPOs, like, you know, when Facebook did their IPO, you know, the price of real estate, I heard like, you know, jumped up in certain areas. Like what, I guess, what have you, like, these are things I'm reading, but I don't live there, but what kind of things have you seen like from a day-to-day -day perspective uh, in terms of how the area has changed? 
Yeah, I mean, I think the when I came here originally in nineties, uh, the area more than half the Bay Area was, uh, you know, you know, uh, the plantation. Like uh, there were a lot of farms, a lot of gardens, a lot of uh, you know wine yards, and all the different different uh, plantation. Other area was very tightly, and those companies were small. I mean, as you said, there are Apple started here. Intel started here. There are a few other companies uh, became big one and all that. But so at that time, uh, there was less number. Okay, the less number is you had to be relative. So I remember still having a picture, the Silicon Valley of the, all the companies around. There were about 3,000 companies. That was a small scale in that time. And if you look at now, I'm sure it is 30,000 30, to 100,000 uh, companies uh, oh, you know, wow. uh, from scale point of view. The second one is the Silicon Valley. Originally, uh, I, my understanding was, you know, it's south of Stanford and Berkeley. So it is in the South Bay area. Uh, but now if you look at the current one, most of the fancy Ubers and you know, Salesforce and everything is in the city. It was in that case at the beginning, uh, all of them. So a lot of these uh, transition has happened in the sense, still there are enough companies on the South Bay area in the Silicon Valley, but in the close to stand, uh, so close to San Francisco city, it's a lot more active now. And with all these, uh, I mean, real estate price has rock, you know, gone through the <laughs> roof. <laughs> and, uh, but still, you know, th that is what keeps, you know, one of the things I, I, people ask me about this again, why people work hard here, you had to work hard. And, you know, you get lucky, you know, you know, one in 10 or one in eight at times. But when you make lucky, and you can buy effort a house, uh, you know, all of those here. So th that is the one people, you know, people are driven here. You know, with obviously COVID, there was a, a big shift, or at least, you know, people talked about it, where people were leaving major hubs like San Francisco, New York, you know, these big traditional like coastal cities and moving to like, you know, Texas or like Florida or like, you know, the Midwest. Um, and I don't know if that's like, you know, people having short term thinking like, okay, because of Zoom and technology and cheaper real estate prices, there's no reason to live in San Francisco or New York, etc. Um, what do you think? Do you think that there's no longer a reason to, if you want to do a startup or just be in the middle of the action and be in San Francisco or um, the Bay Area, do you think it's no longer necessary or does it have the same kind of, um, I guess, impact or pull that it had before? Like, you know how you mentioned when you were there, like you didn't realize having access to, you know, in, uh, investors and other founders and people, all everybody in one place. Do you think with technology and the world changing, do you think that's no longer needed or? No, I mean, uh, I, you know, people keep talking about, you know, demise of, uh, you know, San Francisco or the Silicon Valley and everybody else is getting. And I think the good thing about it is with the connected world, you have access to the, you know, infinite resources around the world from India, China. And because even my, both of my startup, even the, my, the first one, VXL, we had a, a you know a operation in Colorado as well as in India in Bangalore. So we we always had that. So I, what we see because I as you say, I know I do a lot of angel investment. I go through this one. Uh, still, majority of the companies are start out in Bay Area. They have the the core team or the management team here where they can drive within half an hour, 45 minutes and meet different people, get advices and all that. But yes, you are right. On the other hand, the engineers who are, you know, uh, or the operational people, and they are being, you know, uh, outsourced or out, you know, going into different location like uh, Austin, uh, you know, in uh, East Coast, some of the area, Ohio, North Carolina, uh, that part of it, then even Canada, as well as, uh, uh, you know, Taiwan, India, and all that. So it is happening in some level, but I don't see the the nuclear of the team uh, leaving Silicon Valley yet. You know, they are still around, and that is where uh, that 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 energy level. I mean, that that is the one thing a lot of people miss. That yes, you can put the infrastructure, you can put uh, you know of people there and cheap make it cheap and all that. The end of the day, where what it is that energy level which I observe 20 years ago 
has not gone down and it is even even more aggressive yeah and i think with especially since people have been cooped up and isolated for more than a year going back to that kind of energy is probably going to be exciting again right it's hard to replicate certain like when i go to new york city for example because i'm more east coast in toronto yeah. there's a certain level of energy you can't describe it you can't quantify it but when i go to new york city i get excited when i went to san francisco a few times i was like really excited to kind of go there so you're right there's something there that you can't measure so yeah yeah i mean being in that like you know i am now into sales i meet with a lot of these companies who are into the cloud and uh, you know in the edge and ai machine learning and you could see that i mean again the talent is everywhere but taking that talent and making into a product and going to a customer and going into a successful company that is the different story which i mean that is what you know the my accidental entrepreneur i try to bring up those points a lot of people make mistake on oh yeah yeah you know we have resources we have people we have to do thing no you had to connect all those dots as a story and put everything together so that is where i think the silicon valley has been you know so successful mm. and what's like the tamil community there like i've connected with some other folks from there but like um you know i'm used to like the toronto tamil community which is like there's a lot of us and there's like a you know um just like there's a grocery store every block there's a tamil grocery store every block in scarborough where like i grew up so what is it like in you know in the bay area in terms of the size of the tamil community how connected you guys are what's that like okay so again we are talking about tamil versus sri lankan tamil so there are two aspect of it okay. so silicon valley if you look at it uh, you know many of the executives many people from india uh from you know iit metras to many others my co-founder in both company was from is a phd from uh you know he came undergrad after iit metras and so so there is like tens of thousands of tamil people in silicon valley okay so that is the bigger picture and these guys are doing extremely well and if you look at every corporation every company i go to from oracle to google to uh you know facebook to anything you could see those you know tamil uh, people making uh, impact there so i'm very proud of it i always try to find them i connect with them and all that then if you roll back a little bit to sri lankan tamil wise you know again there is about uh 3 400 families are here maybe higher now because it was for example we have a, a organization called tamil sub northern california i was a president uh, like 3 years ago Uh, for two years i was the president uh, of that you know tamil south northern california so that is a very active group bring in uh, bring the you know uh, uh, newcomers to the community connect them have the uh, you know cultural activities as well as you know various connections among themselves so from a sri lankan tamil point of view there are as i said four five hundred families and they are well uh, i could say you know that in toronto you have all different level of economical level uh, you know um, education level and part here all of them are well accomplished uh, you know uh, you know in um, engineering and business and all this area and you can see them every company uh, i go i i see enough of our our people there it could be tamil as overall as well as sri lankan tamil also there yeah that's uh, i was going to make that comment because in toronto Uh, there are obviously a lot of successful tamils in all like facets but i imagine in the bay area especially when you have stanford berkeley um high end you know obviously colleges universities that are there and then you have i've read about so many different founders like yourself or people that are like you know ceo of like obviously um sundar you know of like microsoft or like google yeah, so like I, uh, yeah it's like it's actually i think there was like a, a joker meme that i saw it's like you know not it wasn't a joke but it was more so like a stat like if you look at the ceo names 20 years ago in silicon valley they were all like all caucasian names but now yeah. if you look at it it's like you can't run into any successful or large company without somebody being like at least indian or tamil or south asian so uh um, yeah you're right it's proportionally wise there's probably a lot of very wealthy successful tamil people in in the bay area so and this is where i want to because if you look at my writings one of the reason for doing that is is specifically that for me even though i came from all that i have been successful you know more than billion dollar exits and all that uh, area still i am still 
too soft or too you know uh, you know this this management the soft skills part of it i i was in trained and you know all of our culturally or something from the tamil sri lankan tamil part of it we are you know try to be very nice people and yes. try to you know try to be not offensive try to be not controversial so some of these things are the one draw me to write about this because yes you had to be nice you had to be knowledgeable you had to do that i think that we do very well how do we get to the other you know uh, position of like you know i always talk or in a style my kids about the hamilton line you had to be in the room where the decisions are made it's easier to be outside you know and you know th- those are the part of it i i try to be helpful uh, because most of us even though as I, as you said 400 500 families or even more most of them working in uh, industries most of them are in the key positions but other than some of the few tamil indian tamil uh, very successful uh, people all of us get stuck in that director level vp level or you know uh, architect level and going to the next level has to be you know you know you have to prepare yourself this episode is sponsored by nobody that's right nobody so if you could be kind enough to hit that subscribe button that would mean a lot to me yeah i don't know if you um uh, i you probably heard of the doximity and doximity going their their ipo not too long ago have you heard of doximity no no actually sorry i did mean, oh doximity they're like um it's like the linkedin for doctors um basically oh. it's like they ipo like maybe uh, maybe 3 4 weeks ago um he's actually Sri Lankan Tamil but a friend of mine from like university he moved from Toronto to Doximity like 10 years ago and he's a CTO now at Doximity and they just did an IPO for oh, like yeah, a billion dollars. Oh yeah, I heard that name. Yes, yes. Jay Balachandran. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's a uh, yeah, like you said there's nothing that beats Silicon Valley. There's a reason why my friend left Toronto to go there <laughs> so um and you you know you kind of touched on this earlier. You have multiple exits. You've you know north of a billion dollars in total exit. and you know it started with a uh, VXTel Inc you know tell us about how that idea started you talked about i think you said uh uh the company you worked at before funded you know initially that company and then you know you got acquired by Intel so walk us through everything tell us how you started the company how you got funded to how did the acquisition by Intel happen yeah so it's very interesting so what happened was uh it was the 1990s uh so there's a company a startup company called broadcom i don't know if you heard about them i have heard i have heard of them yes yes <laughs> broadcom they are multi billion yeah. so they were neighbor to my company i rock while i was working at and uh, and they were like no maybe 50 people or you know less than 100 people company at that time these were two professors or phd's from ucla uh you know to henrys who started the company so they there was a guy who was uh, indian guy who went to work for them and he called me and said hey you know they are looking for a person like you so i said okay i'll come and interview and they interview went extremely well i met both founders they liked me and all that they gave me an offer so i i came back so it was like a 15000 shares or something like that so when i come back to my company and my manager says i'll give you $15,000 raise i said oh wow $15,000 that was like i was it was in 90s i was making you know mid uh, hundreds so i was like oh, that was a big number for me and i wanted a stability i took it within a year they went public <laughs> the the 15,000 shares would have made about 3 to 5 million dollar raise wow. uh, money and there are few people who worked in my team uh, when they and they became an overnight millionaires um. and so i was thinking about it what the hell that's what it hit me oh there's a thing called startup going public and all that. i didn't realize that be prayer to that so one of my uh, co-founders who was the main idea guy in the you know bxtel uh, so he was a phd from urbana champaign and he came and said hey i have some idea i'm looking for a guy who can uh, join me as a co-founder and build the product you know building the product that was my talent i done that one very well at rockwell so when i did that so he said okay we can do that all right i we you know we worked on it for about 3 months in his uh, you know they call it garage or his uh, uh, apartment and so we went through all these different different ideas and we came that's the time internet was you know internet 
fiber was becoming, uh, uh, you know, every government was uh, establishing these links and all that. It was 1998. And uh, so that's the time all the telephone uh, conversation communication were done through the copper lines and it was transferred through that. So once you get these, uh, you know, internet, internet uh, the, uh, protocol through these fiber done, so all the voice calls can go there. So one of the, the key understanding was the voice was like a lot of people were talking to India, Sri Lanka, or South America and all that and spending this money on that. So that is where the voice over IP idea came in. So if you can go and find a way to convert uh, this conversation, which is going on a copper line and put it in the internet protocol and send it out and the other side, you can do that. And there was, again, these standards were being established that time. So we found that so our competition was Texas Instrument. They were doing in one chip, they were able to take four calls and compress it and convert it to IP and send it over the line, another one. So we were looking at that, how the architecture is. And me, our co-founders and all of us came up with, so we have five or five founders. We came up with some idea where we can do that about 200 call on one chip. So it's about wow. 50 times faster than anybody can do that. So we came up with that idea. And uh, so then, you know, we were thinking how, what, what to do with that. So over a winter holiday or uh, Christmas holiday, I sat and modeled the whole uh, product and my software guy did the software side of it. And we put together and we were able to find some, uh, you know, intriguing technology or intellectual property uh, again, I own about 35 patents in that area uh, with, with that. So I, I, we were able to come up with some ideas that time. And then uh, with that, we went to a you know, few VCs. And again, I wasn't the key guy on the VC side because that's, I was new. I mean, I didn't know what this means. So these two guys, one marketing guy, one uh, you know, a CTO, they got out and went and met few people. And then we hit one VC, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley. He saw this value. He was looking at this area. And then we flew in in January of 1999 and had a, you know, one day, like a PhD thesis interview. Like, what you guys are doing? Is it real? I mean, I, you know, how do you do that? And on, uh, on that day, end of the day, the guy said, okay, I'm going to put one and a half million dollars uh, for you guys to develop this idea. Uh, are you guys, you know, it's a seed round funding that time. I mean, you know, and, um, and we went back and uh, I, I quit my job and, <laughs> you know, we started that. Uh, it was interesting part on that was I was going to get married about three months after that. My wife just completed her medical degree. I had to go to Sri Lanka and get married. So, uh, so you know, I go back to her and tell her that, hey, by the way, uh, I, just, <laughs> I just quit my job. I'm doing something, you know, on my own and all that. And I'm, you know, her relatives were like, what's he, is he crazy? Cause I was doing very well in my, you know, corporate life. My companies was taking care of me and all that. And I just quit my job and I'm bringing her to us and, uh, you know, started this one. That, that was an interesting journey. <laughs> and uh, that's so, amazing. You, a $1.5 million seat run is pretty big for back then. Cause you know, that, that was pretty massive, right? I know. See, this is one of the things. I think you had a question. Uh, you talked about, you know, uh, raising money versus going, you know. Uh, bootstrapping, uh, yeah. Bootstrapping and all that part. I know because for both of my companies, which I was part of the founding team, we raised money. We raised because we had, we believe we have a market, we have the technology, we have validation, and we can go after and I see lately a lot of these, you know, companies going bootstrapping or trying to raise, you know, 100K, 550K, 200K. Uh, we went all, all, all in. I mean, as I said, we quit our jobs, you know, we didn't yeah. have any. I mean, I was in early, uh, late 20s. I didn't have much saving. So in U.S., without much saving, I had to, you know, put up with this. So uh, it is, you know, it, so that is sometimes I advise my pe people also. You have to be convinced that this idea is going to take you to next level, okay? If not, the experience you are going to get out of that, it'll, it'll boost you in a, in, you know, in a corporate life even to the better level, yeah? So that, that is my idea. I never thought about failure. I never thought about, you know, I mean, I, you know, uh, you know worried about all this. 
I, I yeah, and you mentioned you had pets. I remember when I googled you first when I met you, and I was like, I was like looking through it, like there was all these patent like searches in Google. I was like, wow, this guy owns a lot of Google patents. So I mean, a lot of <laughs> patents. So how does that work? Because you obviously the technology you created was very like innovative and very new, and um, is the patent like under your name or is it under the company's name? And when you sell the company, do the patents go along with it or do you get to keep it personally? Like, how does that work? Okay, so the, there are two aspects. Let me look at the, you know, people, I want people to understand when you are building a company or building an idea, I really look for intellectual property. So the patent process, which I understood very clearly. So you need to have a, a creative method of, you know, doing something. So that is the part which a lot of people miss. So I, uh, I didn't know either before I started the company, then I started working with some patent lawyers. Then I realized, oh my God, so many different areas you can do the patent, uh, create the patent for it. Okay, the second part of it, what you're asking is, uh, yes, when a company acquires, uh, okay, even when you are working for a startup and even if you're founding comp uh, part, the name of the patents are on you and, and who are the uh, people who are starting the company, you know, or the who, who are the... Uh, people who are creating the pattern, okay? It, it, it is uh, forever. The, what, what it means is, the, uh, it, but it will be owned by the company. So the company who, like for example, VXTEL owned my pattern, not me. So they paid for it. It was while I was working on that. When Intel acquired us, all the pattern get transferred to them. Got it. Okay. So the, these are pattern, but it's still, you, I can, I have the, you know, the, the name on the pattern, the inventors, will be whoever the people who worked on it but you can't monet <clears throat> so like once you got acquired there's no further monetization of that patent because you've said okay i've created it with the startup you acquired the startup so i still have the name like i invented or i, I was the creator of this patent but i can no longer make money from the patent no you can't you yeah. can't i mean you can i mean you, you can as the experience you can show them and you can put it in your resume and all that but the patent is owned by the company, uh, you know, whoever uh, you are working for. So that is one other thing when you go and work for any company, even the startup to big one, they ask you to, uh, you know, sign uh, the non-disclosure agreement is one of them. The other one is intellectual property, uh, you know, uh, document. So that is their own. So <clears throat> you guys created this company, you, got, you raised 1.5 million, you're all in, you just got married. Um, so now, how did you, like, what was the use case for this technology? Like, who did you go and sell this technology to? Like, who are your yeah. customers? And then, you know, how did Intel come to know of you guys and then want to acquire you? Tell us about that after. Yeah. Yeah. So this is another area which I advise people also on, you know, how, you know, this is an enterprise product. This is not a, you know, you know a consumer product going directly selling to it. So you had to find who are your customers are, who are your channels are, who we are going to sell it through because the end of the day it is going to go to telcos yeah and the telcos are the one doing this uh you know they buy these boxes from ericsson's and uh different different companies but the chips goes into that with mm -hmm. the firmware it come from like broadcom intel qualcomm and various companies yeah so you know so basically we when we uh, got the first round of funding so we got the first you know one and a half million dollars and uh, seed round and then we next six months we aggressively worked on it we were ramping up the team uh, to like 10 15 people and we got all of these ideas in and while you know a couple of the guys again i was i was putting my head down and we had to show the milestones yeah and we, we are making good progress showing the performance showing the progress so i was the guy who was running the engineering side so then the other two founders who are marketing guys who went and did two things. One of them is you started talking to the bigger VCs. And one of them uh, was Sequoia. You heard about it yep. in a Sequoia. Yes. So yeah. they uh, heard about our technology and they found, uh, you know, there are always, there is some networking, some connection through somebody get introduced to us. So we went to them uh, to talk to them. And while we were doing that, we got to do some customer validation. So that is where Intel, Cisco, there's a company called Vitesse Semiconductor, 
and there are another two companies i think most of them are now bank you know gone away so about four or five companies so we talk to their business development people so one of the area which i always tell is you know if you go and talk to some engineering in these companies they wouldn't want to hear from you because you are trying to take their job away yeah so you go to these uh, business development people or the vp level people who find there is a big gap in this area in their portfolio and and you go and talk to them and say hey we have a uh, you know we have a, a interest in technology you are not uh, addressing that market by us uh, you know partnering with us and you know take the low risk uh, you uh, you would be able to you know get to this market early as a early adapter of you know uh, to that so we had this you know th- four or five of these companies and uh, luckily i mean again I, some of these are you know uh, lucky or some of them are, uh, it happened uh, you know naturally uh, with all this conversation uh, they believed in us you know they believed and said these guys know what they are doing they are talking about uh, and what is the technology and there is a market segment to it so as part of the next round of funding we raised about 15 million dollars in that time we got about half of it from the the corporate uh, people uh, because as a partners and they can put it and other half came from you know sequoia and some couple of these vcs so that way you build that you know already you building a sales channel uh, yes, or you know true. early validation uh, and, and and that part of it so that because of the, those two Uh, and overall we raised about 75 million dollars uh, in that uh, start, that company uh, and then we exceeded 600 million so it was a pretty you know uh, good amount uh, but you know you go through that process of you know finding the right customer partner and the same time you find a vc because i always tell the vcs are important uh, for you to you know they they are very greedy and they are very uh, you know upfront about the facts and they will tell you to your face you know versus the corporate guys are they will meet with you every few months and they'll give you some feedback but you know they don't if this is a small you know a drop in the bucket for them so the intel was one of the investors in that uh, round and that's how we got them you know hooked into our product i see and uh, the interesting thing was intel a similar time i acquired another company called uh, i think diablo or something another company which one was uh, building these uh, boxes to go into telco for voice over ip so they needed a chip partner uh, i see and you know oh it's 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 a perfect fit so they found that and uh, they you know they came and looked at our product and it, again the our exit was two year within two years okay? wow so from first one and we as i said we raised within that year and a half we raised 75 million dollars and we built the team from you know five founders to about 150 to 200 people in that time and then built a full product which was able was being qualified in multiple customers at that point so after that i assume that your wife's relatives in sri lanka no longer question your decision to quit the job <laughs> they always said oh, you know uh, you know ruben is related to me now <laughs> <laughs> so that's amazing you know, i mean actually, actually more than that actually it was interesting more canadian uh, relatives and australian relatives who are tamils who are there uh, they tend to make uh, jokes uh, that oh ruben won uh, won lottery in america you know <laughs> and uh, you know <laughs> that's amazing so you you got this exit and you said you did it because i you started a second company after this and then you also exited so let me ask you this like you've exited you did it very well at the exit why you didn't start another company why not just you know relax okay. for a bit or you know do something else did you know that every time you left a 5 out of 5 review for this podcast a tamil parent lets their child pursue a career in the creative arts okay that's probably not true but if there's a chance that it is do you really want to jinx it leave a review do it for the young creative in you so i'm going to tell you you asked another question i think you knew earlier uh, thing you sent me about what it makes you tick uh, yeah. or how, what it makes part of it for me it's a fear of losing okay i mean i i'm i'm very 
uh, I don't want to say insecure, but in in kind of insecure guy because I need to prove myself continuously. Being a last child of seventeen, <laughs> I'm never good enough because you know my <laughs> elder brother says you can do more, mm-hmm. you can work harder, and all that. And I and and I always you know and I didn't have a country to go back to. I mean, you know, in America, I mean, I'm here and I'm working, and I had to work harder, harder, harder. So all these, uh, you know, so the fear of lose, you know, fear of failing, you know, of, you know, and and sometimes the, the the toxic, you know, you know, toxic of success, you know, sometimes you know you, you you look at it, and so it, you know after five years I was at Intel because I had to stay at Intel to complete the transaction, you know, there you know there are some restriction on when I can leave. So then I left, and I actually I kind of retired when I was 35. I took a year off. Uh, my wife wanted to do her medicine, uh, you know, re- residency. So we moved to New Jersey. I was uh, stay at home dad with my d- uh, first daughter, and my wife went back to you know work. And I was uh, we were thinking about it, and she didn't enjoy working, and uh, you know she had enough of this memory from Jaffna about all the war zone. So you know, yeah, she decided to come. As he said, I'm not going to. I'm not enjoying it, and we are financially well off. Why do we have to do this? So she, you know, we, we chose to come back. So that's the time again. Uh, another VC. So uh, the guy, one of the guy who invested in first man, he got like he invested about 10 million. He got about 150 million out of our investment. It's like a 10x. He made his fund out of my first company, <laughs> and uh, so that guy uh, said. Hey, you know the same guys are having another idea. The second company I was in the founder founder. I mean, I was the founding team members. So there were two PhDs, one guy from Google and one guy from uh, my my in the CTO from my previous company. So they were putting some ideas together, and they said they need an operational guy to be able to go and build this product and get it to the market. So they called me as the third guy to come in, uh, and uh, and you know, because for me that was. I don't know for something. Once I see, uh, you know, a market and an idea, I could easily imagine, you know, visualize, visualize how the product are being built, how to build a team, how to qualify it, how to get to the market, how to convince the customer. Those are the, you know, stories uh, which, uh, you know, I mean, actually tomorrow I'm putting a, uh, my, you know, the video log about storytelling. So this is one of the area which I am so uh, it is you not know, first nature to me. You know I can do that, and so that's why I joined the second company. It took a long time. The second one was because the 2006 we started. 2008 we went through the downturn on the uh, the yes. financial uh, meltdown, and we were near bankrupt in 2009, and we had a like a few million dollars in the bank on that. Again, we raised good money again second time. Uh, so I walked into our board and said, "Okay, guys, I can do this product within that money without raising." So we went and re, you know, uh, read the whole engineering architecture, and we rebuilt the product, and that went into, you know, uh, we were able to exceed for about seven hundred twenty million dollars. Yeah. Wow. And what what was that product like? What did that product do? Uh, actually, okay, that is an interesting area. Again, all of these are uh, the voice or IP was basically, you know, uh, voice uh, call. This one was a data center. So if you think about 2006, all Google, Facebook, and everybody is coming up building these big data centers. They were spending so much money on <laughs> energy and uh, you know uh, energy consumption and power and all that. So I'm actually my my Stanford uh, master's degree is mainly on low power technologies. So I applied that one with our software and hardware guys. So basically, it's a solid. It's a Hard drive in uh, using like you know nowadays it's famous uh, SSDs called solid state drives. So th- we were building a solid state drive which can process this one and uh, and 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 go and uh, transact in you know billions of uh, operations uh, at that. For example, one of our main customer was LinkedIn. So mm. who were you guys listening to all that? So they became our customer in 2011, 2012. So all of your transaction came out of my uh, product. Wow! The sense, so you have the storage in the back end, 
but when you are going and looking at your you know linkedin uh, you know bio and looking at all these data all these information and it has to be customized for each one of the users depending on who you, you are talking to and all that so that caching layer we call it uh, it was built on our ssd because it was like thousand times faster than going on a hard drive so that is where we went and you know you know we we, we build that solid state drive which goes into the pcie slot of the servers and, and what was the company called and then who acquired it uh, it was viriden uh, viriden v i r i d e n t again the name is viridas is uh, green i heard in uh, latin or some, some other language so viriden is a green technology and uh, it was uh, acquired by western digital corporation uh, for some because they are they were working on a hard drive and they wanted to go into the solid state drive uh, area so they bought us to you know get into that market wow so you had two exits almost billion dollars each and you know what did you do after so now you know hopefully you felt like you've proved yourself <laughs> uh, not you not know. yet actually i mean it is uh, uh, for me because you see these are all happy part of it as, as i went through the second startup uh, there were a lot of happy moments from a personal accomplishment point of view. I had again another 15 or uh, 16 patents. I had done the engineering and all that. We were successfully qualified engineers. But there are, you know, there are a lot of um, and the politics in, you know, even startups. You know, when you stayed for seven years, I had to go through uh, and there were new CEOs came and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, the, the restructuring of the company and uh, all of those. And because of that, you know, it was a little bit difficult for me uh, from a, a, you know, personally, from a mental stability sometimes, you know, you get uh, stress about unnecessary thing, not about the company, not about the product, but about the uh, people you are working with sometime or, uh, you know, habit. And I always openly talk about that because, you know, it is not always as easy as going and making money and doing that. There are behind, uh, behind your back, people make deals which you don't you're not aware of it until you get exposed to it so it was not in my opinion i was a successful i made good money but there were i could have made a lot more money because of there are things happen uh, in in that environment uh, so uh, after that i went through a, you know so i got acquired the western digital i still work for western digital uh, you know they took care of me very well i was in engineering i moved to sales actually I help with them selling this product to many. Oh, of sorry, these. you're still there. You haven't like after your vesting trip. No, no, now. I'm no, I'm not because for me they they I because I two ways I look at it. They they paid a lot of money, so I want to make sure they you know I pay back. And the other side of it is I get access to a lot of customers. I can help them um, you know sell these. Uh, Again, the storytelling part of it. People tell me about when I go, uh, when I go in front of you know some of the you know. It's called I4, the main internet companies. I go and talk to them and I sell, you know, a product to them. And I, I'm successful on that. So these guys, you know, make me, you know, I have a team of five people. We, we you know, all US, we, so I have access to a lot of these technology and all that part of it. So I still, my day job is there. I do that. And on the, you know, so in the day, in the night job, I do, you know, angel investment. And I do help with other things from Sri Lanka and all that. So in terms of like angel investing, I know it's like the natural thing when you've made quite a bit of money building startups, it's kind of the natural transition. But why did you decide to get into angel investment and like maybe talk about an investment you did that did maybe very well or that you were proud to invest in? Because I know you invested in a number of companies and you share that as well. Yeah, so I, I try to share as much as information as I can uh, on that. Uh, uh, you know, on the internet to encourage people to think about it. So I had one of the advisors in my first company, he was at AMD that time, uh, and he's, you know, Amos, he's from Israel, and he keep asking me, hey, you know, you should come and join them. Because most of the angel investors, if you look at it, most of them are not founders or startup people. They are the big corporate people who have made good money as a VP or CEO. So they want to diversify and do some investment uh, and, and make that you know, money, the extra money. Um, so I, I, I only got into that about three or four years ago. Uh, prior to that, 
because I, I looked at that. I mean, I don't know if you guys know, but angel investment is not as fun. I mean, it is very high risk. It's a long-term return. It's like normal return is eight to 10 years out. If you get lucky. <laughs> if you get lucky, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. So because of that, I am, you know, being coming from this, you know, from Sri Lanka, from my fa- losing my father, financial difficulties and all that. So I really didn't want to, you know, whatever money I made, I bank it. <laughs> I know I put, <laughs> I put it in Goldman Sachs and they manage my, you know, investments. So that way I don't have to worry about it because I know I can, I'm still an able person. I can go make more money rather than try to, you know, uh, I don't want to make a quick bug. You know what I'm saying? Like if people try to say, oh, I invest and you can 10x return and all that. No, you don't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I was very reluctant. But the reason I got into that was I felt as I, as I'm writing again about, uh, you know, accidental entrepreneur, uh, I see a lot of people make a lot of sm- small mistakes. Even those angel investors who invest on the uh, companies, they try to be very short-sighted. They don't uh, you know, uh, treat the you know, founders well. They don't understand how to help them and all that. But I, I, my DNA is that, you know, I can help that. So that is where I came into, uh, feel, felt like, let me go and see. So, so far I have invested about 40 companies. Uh, a small amount, you know, five, ten, fifty thousand, you know, in in that range, I put it together, and uh, because you see, if you have a return, it it is return is twenty times or thirty times, you know, but if you, most of them, it will go away. <laughs> you're <not laughs> yeah, going, uh, you're not going to go away. So if you look at it, um, so that, I mean, again, I I didn't, I wanted to spend my time and understanding what is going on in the industry. This is a way of understanding the future, yeah, the, how people are starting companies and all that. So that's why I got in. Uh, but again, if I'm trying to make money out of it, I don't think this is the right place. I agree with you. Um, it's something that I was considering in the future, you know, when I get to a certain state. But the more I kind of read about it, it's angel investing is probably the, the best reason to do it is if you have FOMO, if you feel like you're missing out on opportunities. but as a founder, if you're building something, you can only build one thing at a time. But with angel investing, like you said, if you're putting money into something like, you know, I put money into Bitcoin or Ethereum, you're more incentivized to learn about that company or that industry, right? So, yes. Uh, yes. So you're right, though. Like, like you said, if you invest in 40 companies, $50,000 each, maybe three or four of those companies do well. And then you, you know, you make two or three times return, but you can easily make more money you know, putting money into, you know, Bitcoin or property or other things, right? So Property, other, and, and even like I tell people, I mean, if you do the time average uh, investment on uh, mutual funds and, uh, you know, high growth, depending on your age, yeah. uh, I, I suggest people to look at it because to be Index honest- Index funds, right? Index in, funds, right? Index yeah. fund, to be honest, I mean, I have my 401k. I've been working for 25 plus years now. My 401k, He's in multi-million dollars uh, uh, now because of I was disciplined. I was average in every two weeks in my paycheck. It goes, you know, six to eight percent. There's a company match. Uh, and then, you know, you invest this money into when early stage in a aggressive, you know, growth funds. You put it out there. You let it go. I'm telling you, you know, people have to realize that is the, you know, that should be your stable. And then you add, they take about 5% of your money and you can play with all these things. Yeah, the, uh, somebody had a famous saying, I think um, uh, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And a lot of people don't realize that. Um, so I agree with you there. Yeah, so a couple of <laughs> investment. I mean, I have about 40 companies uh, in my list, but few of them are very interesting. The space industry is very interesting to me on that. So yeah. I have you know, a few of them, like one company is... Uh, uh, which is building a 3D uh, printing of the whole spaceship. Oh, and wow. They, uh, so the, what they, the, 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 imp- the end result we had to look at it is, say we want to go to colony to moon or Mars or something. So rather than, you know, if you go there, how do you come back? So if you can take this factory out there and build, uh, you know, all the components there and all that. So they already got like, multiple hundreds of million dollar contract from NASA and all that to do these things. So, you know, you look at, they have a core technology, do they have the right people and do that. So there is another interesting company, which I talk about, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, I shared in my LinkedIn was uh, OrbitFab. 
So this company is building gas station in uh, space. What does that mean? <laughs> the gas station means is uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, there are so many satellites are being launched now. Yeah, if you look at it lately with the communication, satellite, all of that, after that five year lifetime or 10 year lifetime, they break down and they drop in the ocean or wherever it is and they disappear. Uh, the, one of the main reason was their fuel cell. They still, they use various solar and all those power, but still need to be, uh, you know, the power uh, batteries and all that has to be live and all that. So what this one does is this is like a, ga a floating gas station. So the, when these uh, satellites are going to uh, be, uh, you know, discharged, and this one will go and connect to it and it will uh, you know give new charge and new life to it and they'll kick it back in the orbit so that is what this uh, you know so this is interesting technology that's, you know? that's very interesting how how would how would the how would the charger power itself so that is the technology they are working on they have they are defining uh, you know so they these uh, payloads which goes into this uh, this is a gas station that's the one they had to launch it continuously. And these cells will come and attach to it with a standard interface. And based on that, it will get charged and then it will go into the space. That's super interesting. Yeah, see, yeah. like like you said, you might never make money from it, but at least you get to learn <laughs> about something super interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then like, so this is a space ones, many of them. Then I am looking at some biomedical one. Uh, like I have diabetic. So, you know, uh, one thing I want to tell you people is, it's all fun, not fun. I mean, three years ago or four years ago, I was nearly dead because I had a heart attack. Oh, wow. <laughs> After all this fun and all these part because of, you know, I think the family thing, as well as the stress of some of the startups life, you know, I had it. And so, you know, the diabetic, so basically is a glucose level and how we managed and all that. So mm. there is a company who is looking at using the saccharine to do some of these in, for diabetic as well as heart attack, how we can uh, create different uh, cells and things. And today, I, I think I shared one company called Volumetric in the LinkedIn, which one is 3D printing organs. Yeah, I think I saw, I've heard of, I've, yeah, I've seen the companies do that, or that's yeah. super fascinating. Yeah, so, so if you look at it, that one, and then I go into some of them, like uh, there's a company called Mythical Games, they do, uh, you know, uh, gaming uh, for, uh, like, you know, their platform for people to build their own games and then they can put their own characters and with NFT and, and a Bitcoin coming in so they can, people can share and sell each other and all that. So that company is, you know, another one. And just like that, you know, some education area, like Knowledge Hook, which is a Canadian Travis, uh, yeah. Yeah, Travis Travis, startup. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I know, I believe in those guys actually. And I invested something there. So it's, there are many companies, as I said, it's about 40 companies now. That's amazing. Yeah, shout out to Travis. Uh, he's a very, very smart entrepreneur. Um, no, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing all that about your angel investing. So we talked a lot about your work, but what do you like to do outside of work? What do you do for fun? So, uh, so another part of my, you know, learning as an entrepreneur early stage was I was, uh, I was a very good cricket player. Uh, so I was the captain of our, you know, a region team and I was, uh, you know, I played for by my school, Hardly College. And, uh, you know, when I came to U.S. early stage, uh, I used to play cricket in, uh, you know, in, in various teams. So that is one of the early part. Once I started my company and my family came in and then my uh, I had kids. So that the time, you know, I didn't have much time to do that. Yes. So the lately, uh, you know, there are two aspects. One of them is, as I said, I enjoy conversing with young people from, you know, all over the world, Australia, Sri Lanka, India, UK, Canada, and, and, and US, uh, of course, and I help them with ideas. And, you know, people text me all the time through my WhatsApp. So I, you know, that's the best way to reach me. And then I will give them hints and all that. So the mentoring, uh, I spent quite a bit of time. Uh, other fun stuff is uh, actually, if you go to YouTube and search for Ruben KK or Ruben, I am a ballroom dancer, actually, me and my oh, wife. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife is a dancer. She was a Pradhanatyam, she was very good at dancing and all that. 
so she was so i gave her as a gift uh, about 10 or 11 years ago uh, for a one uh, lesson uh, for in you know, a ballroom dancing and uh, since then i got in more than her sometimes she says because <laughs> <laughs> it, it's so fun uh, you know and you know once you're on the floor you don't realize i love performing uh, so we we have a lot of videos on uh, on that so uh, so that's one like yes before today uh, we i had a you know lesson uh, on uh, you know uh, cha cha and rumba <laughs> so, uh, i want to look that up i'm going to i want to i got to see ruben and i doing uh, these different dances so <laughs> um so you know oh sorry go ahead you were going to say something yeah but i but my my i tried to spend a lot of time with family and my you know kids my son is now 13 he's the guy who's into the techie stuff and all that my other daughter is uh, second daughter is who's into cooking and uh, biology and all that so i help uh, we i love cooking also you know and uh, i spend time we we create different different uh, things so uh, enough things to do <laughs> yes food wise after eating tamil food i don't think anything else is as flavorful i mean i do enjoy no. other kinds of food the tamil food is so flavorful if you're used to all the spice and just the flavor oh yeah everything else doesn't taste as good <laughs> no uh, um, money can be hard to come by, but here is a hundred dollar opportunity for you. Join my free newsletter for free exclusive content and a free chance to win a hundred dollars when I hold special draws. Did I mention that it's free? In terms of, um, you know, um, one thing I was curious about, you talked about as you got a fat, you know, you, you have more life experience than me. So are there, you know, in terms of like outside of family, do you find it hard to maintain other relationships like friendships and things like that as you you know um got busier with family and obviously work like how how have you been able to do that yeah it is it is quite difficult you know because i think you know we are busy with our work and we are busy with uh, uh you know some of the investment and some of the uh, uh, you know being maintaining your health one side and the family side of it it is quite uh, difficult so, for example, I mean, the WhatsApp is one of the good way. And uh, so, for example, Hardly College, uh, you know, we have a group of about 120 people, uh, our classmates mm. all over the world, from you know, Australia to US in between. So we join there, we chat about different, different experiences and different things. So we connect that with the, you know, that friendship, which you created before high school or during high school, it lasts forever. Mm. And the later part of it, I, you know, it evolves over time. You know, I played cricket and I got friends in Southern California. Once I moved to Bay Area, I had to, you know, establish new set of friends or family friends because of the, you know, wife and kids. And as a family, you started building that network. And um, so it is very, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, lately, I'm not keeping up with all my friends uh, on that way. But I still try to, you know, uh, check on them once in a while and uh, connect them. And, you know, because you can openly discuss, openly talk about different struggles, different things you go through. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the biggest thing is for men, I mean, the, in the mental part of it, you know, sometimes you accomplish things or you have gone through things and, you know, you want to be, have some, you know, a space where you can talk about it. So yeah. that's another area which I, you know, even though my heart attack was a, a wake up call for me, uh, since then I talk about uh, counseling, going to you know somebody and talk about you know openly uh, outside that is very important so mm -hmm. when people feel down people feel not good and checking up on them so the mental health uh, area is very important very good um this is more of a fun question but like is there any item or experience or something that you purchased in the last three to five years that you have no regrets about like it's something that ordinarily you wouldn't spend money on but you're like you once you bought it you're like you had you know you don't regret it something yeah, that's I mean, like very expensive yeah yeah i mean the few the, the thing today is actually i am very i i don't like things much <laughs> i don't yeah. spend much time and being you know seven kid and going through a lot of tra struggle i'm very frugal and very careful spending money on me uh, so my wife loves uh, cars and all that. So as I'm, I'm, I enjoy it too. So we have two Teslas. Uh, you know, I bought one. First one is 2013 Model S, and the Model X uh, about three years ago. 
so that is a big you know spending but one thing which we do is we travel around the world a lot i mean i've been to argentina that's where like you know there was my wife posted a, uh, in her instagram uh, yesterday me dancing in a street with uh, a tango with a lady there uh, <laughs> you know in in a street dances so i i you know we travel in australia i was in Bo- botswana i lived in a short time there so i tra- we traveled there so lately because of the covid we are not able to travel so what where i spend some money which is a pretty pretty good money is i rented a, a like a penthouse in san francisco just in front of the salesforce tower at 36 floor and you can see the whole bay, bay you know bay bay bridge and uh, golden gate bridge and all that area so we rent uh, that a uh, three bedroom apartment for uh, about 15 months so you know we go there in the weekends uh, as a family and so that is you know i would not normally spend that money but i don't regret a bit of it because that gives us you know a mental health as well as you know enjoyment getting out of the house you know so that's awesome i love that idea yeah um in terms of like your personal legacy um how do you want to be remembered by your friends and family yeah i mean for me uh, the, the the simplest thing is you know i i try to be humble i try to not you know i mean uh, and but honest uh, to, people sometimes tell me you are too honest at uh, telling <laughs> them uh, you know because people reach out to me for various things and i see uh, you know uh, going back to the entrepreneurial journey i wanted to make money i wanted to do great things but that was in the starting point i had to work hard i had to have a product i had to do that a lot of people jump into this and uh, you know try to do because you know meetups and uh, you know networking and all that but they forget to build their company they forget to build that mm. so i am i try to be as honest and on one on one i never will tell anybody else but i will tell the guy hey you are wasting your time here or you are not doing the right thing so i try to be a truth teller and a, and a practical guy uh, on that and the other one is you know i we me and my wife try to do a lot of uh, uh, non profit work in sri lanka uh, but it's uh, earlier i did like in my elementary school we build a thing in a hospital we build something and all that as a donation uh, lately my wife had an idea we started a you know company called Uh, a app called design crasher which is all developed in jaffna uh, by a, a team of uh, engineer 10 people and this is a very you know it's a interior design app uh, so she has that idea she has the company she is a ceo to me is building that ecosystem building you know helping those so so you ask me what i want to be remembered for is those kind of you know if i had made impact on those 10 families if i had made you know there are other companies which i uh, advise and help them if you know they employ say 50 people uh, if i had make in that impact they don't have to know they don't have to tell me about it but i know in my heart of heart i have helped them so that's how i want to be remembered uh, more than all these money and all these fanciness Yeah, that's exciting. It, it, like when I look at Sri Lanka, there's a few people that I've connected with like Miller and like a few others uh as well that are doing some great things there. I feel like um there's a lot of effort being put into the north northeast to hopefully and you know if the war never happened it probably would have already happened, but it could have been the Silicon Valley of Asia if yes. with the talent, you know, with the money that could have went into there, uh but obviously the war obviously slowed down that progression, but now I'm seeing more and more progress there and obviously people yeah, like the, yourself yeah correct the sense i grow sense uh, i am an advisor to them actually i'm formally uh, you know helping them out so to bring their uh, capability to silicon valley so they are mm. talking to about five companies in silicon valley they are already working with one company and they already uh, you know partner with that so this is what exactly i'm talking about where for the people who are listening to in this one if you have a product if you have an idea uh, if you have not idea but if you have a product and if you are dedicated your life and it, you feels you know you need to take to the next level of going to market getting some customers getting some genuine feedback please reach out to me because that is where i am enjoying i'm not in uh, into the time of somebody want to be entrepreneur and helping them formulate and all that that's a lot of work that yeah. they had to do themselves but if you have a product and if you have a 
market idea and all that. And if you want to validate, uh, please reach out to me. I'm, I'm there to help you on that. I know people definitely, people should definitely do that. <laughs> um, and that's kind of a great way to kind of segue into the, the last part of this discussion, which is a, a fun game that I like to call Creator Confessions. I didn't send you these questions. This is more meant to be a fun, a fun little kind of game. So it's going to be like some statements, like uh, quick questions I'll ask. It's meant to be a speed round. So uh, are you ready, Rubenana? Yes, go for it. All right. First question is favorite Tamil food. Um, a kot roti. Uh, something that scares you. Fear of death. Favorite show you're watching. Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, the, the, I am not a TV person or movie person. So ah, okay. or, or read books, <laughs> all three of them. <laughs> but but I, I have some books though. But, uh, but other than that, uh, no, I don't. But I mean, I had in Big Bang Theory as well as uh, Seinfeld. I mean, Seinfeld when I came here. So the, the, so the sitcoms, a couple of sitcoms were the um, A place you're itching to travel to after the pandemic is over. Um, I mean, of course, Sri Lanka, uh, I want to do that uh, to meet my mom, who is 91 years old. Uh, but uh, the area which we love to go is South America. Uh, we went to Argentina, so other areas, Peru and various areas. Uh, one of my, I, want, I, I guess it's part of South America. I want to go to Galapagos Islands. I love animals, so yeah. I'd love to go there. Um, a fellow Tamil creator that you want to give a shout out to? From a creator point of view, any creator, yeah, like. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, uh, you know, I, I looked at all the music uh, area part of it. You know, Rahman is, of course, you know, he has done amazing things uh, to spread Tamil and the capability part. So that he was the one. But you know, to me, if you look at all my writings, Kruvalluvar is the <laughs> most prominent creator for me. So I, yeah. I read through Kral a lot. And I, I can try to connect that 3,000 year old, uh, uh, you know, uh, couplets to the real life of now. So if you ask me, the real creator is uh, through, uh, through our lawyer. Okay. Um, your favorite childhood memory? Uh, the favorite, favorite is, you know, in, as I said, in Sri Lanka, Jaffna, Point Petru, uh, Ploli, where I, I lived there. Uh, just, you know, the morning breeze at 10 o'clock, uh, even though we feel so hot now when we go back, that time, that that is a perfect time. And going to that, you know, the temples or, uh, you know, associations and around that area in that village and walking through the field, that, that, that is nothing can, you know, uh, beat that. I had a question for you because uh, obviously you grew up in Sri Lanka. I, I was born there, but I came here when I was three. So I don't remember this. But I'm scared of snakes, and I know there's a lot of snakes in Sri Lanka. Were you, yeah. Were you, so were you never like afraid of like snakes in like the paddy fields and all? No, I mean no. In the house, I was I was lying down in our bedroom. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, because there is like a you have tiles underneath there. You have these wooden uh, frames. Yeah. The snakes will just walk and uh, you know, run through that. You know. And you were um, never scared. No, we just sleep through. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, I mean, in, the, in our backyard, we had the snake, uh, you know, whatever the pit or whatever it yeah. is. And that is, uh, that area is, a re, you know, uh, a keep out area for kids. But the snakes come and go, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm scared. <laughs> uh, what's a pet peeve of yours? What's that? A pet peeve, like something that people do that might annoy you. Oh, <laughs> My, my, everybody knows that because um, I have, I hate when people eat and with open mouth and make a noise, you know, <laughs> oh, I, I hear like people are like, I had a couple of my founders who are like so much noisy and they enjoy the food with, you yeah. know, and, you know, make it, the noise and <laughs> make the biting sound and all that. Uh, I can't, that is psychologically, my brain goes into a while. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, a regret that you would have? I mean, the fundamental thing is, you know, as I said, because I lost my dad when I was 12 and my son is 13 and, you know, to see them go through their life, uh, you know, at least a little bit later. So for example, my family, my dad was a pretty decent, you know, a successful person. But if he had seen now, 
all you know seven of us uh, doing very well uh, all around the world so that's why i you know i you know I, that's what i would be regret you know my family you know missing them them missing me mm. to be able to do that um a celebrity whose life you want to experience for one day <laughs> celebrity yeah i mean I, i would say you know uh, steve jobs uh, will be one of the guys uh, to me because i have worked with people who worked with him the first hand worked with him and all that and people always give a lot of negative thing about him you know being very abrupt and all that uh but for me i have worked with a lot of you know the silicon valley you work with the challenging people and all that i i thrive in that situation so i would have been loved to see how you know how i would have reacted or you know helped him you know get to this level you know mm, that's a great answer and finally what's a, a public service announcement or like you know final thoughts that you want to leave our audience with today Yeah so the, the the important part of it is you know if you look at it uh, I'm you know the accidental entrepreneur series and uh, those part of it the reason I write that is in our Tamil community that's what I think we are targeting here uh, we have the talent we have the brain power we have the capability and we have the knowledge where we sometimes get stuck at is networking in a right way and looking at you know uh, you know uh, the, you know looking for some handout versus being you know genuine and and getting that uh, uh you know help from others but you prove yourself so to me is you know th- for those people uh we need to go to the next level of these you know all these organization and all that but to me where people are tend to be making a lot of mistakes are uh, is going into business degree immediately you know from und- and und- for undergrad and all that but to me i want people to have a core technology or core uh, some kind of talent which has to be first done and then you go into this area so what do i mean by that is don't waste your you know time uh, because see guys we like it or not we are brown skin <laughs> we are we, we are in a in a different area in the world and all that so what i ask is everybody to be you know you ha- bring in the value what you can you know everybody no one can reject you on top of it then build that next level of the conversation you know communication and storytelling uh, you know those areas how you you know do so i ask people to just you know focus on breadth as well as some depth that way you will be able to always stand on your own and be successful great message Uh, and that's kind of a great way to kind of end off today's podcast. Um, so, Ruben, I, you're, uh, I, you know, amazing, great storyteller. It was great kind of hearing about your journey, the companies you built, and kind of, you know, what you're, you're, what you're up to now. So, for anybody kind of listening today that wants to reach out and connect with you, they've been inspired by your story. They want to just pick your brain. Uh, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, first connect me through LinkedIn. and uh, that way you know once we pass few of the in linkedin exchanges through uh, you know some of the connection and then i request you know i know i write a lot i wrote 45 articles already and i'm continue to write a lot more and i'm putting some videos out there listen to those i mean you don't have to listen to all uh, read all of them at least some of them so you know get that basic information and then reach out to me through linkedin uh, and uh, you know again whatsapp is uh, eventually what i do is once i pass that i can be helpful i'll pass you guys the information on whatsapp or email and then uh, we can go from there perfect um and i promise guys i'll try to find the videos of rubanana doing his tango or whatever dances <laughs> he's doing but uh thank you guys thank you rubanana for kind of hopping on the podcast and thank you everyone for listening and uh, if you have any feedback feel free to reach out see you on the next episode okay thank you thank you very much